ETA and Transcom full conference attendees. Muy buenos dias. Anyang ha sayo. Sabahu akya. Magandang umaga. Hude morhan. And it says good morning, it's almost good afternoon. Hi, y'all. And, and welcome to the greatest logistics and transportation show on earth, us. Four duty days in command, ladies and gentlemen, and three of those days I've spent here with you in beautiful Union Station, St. Louis. And I'm here to tell you, so far, command is amazing. <laughs> I would like to compliment the Union Station staff, the NDTA Association, and the countless volunteers for making this week special. And if you agree that Chief B.K. Krizelnik set our souls on fire with conviction for our purpose, show it. Chief, while I love a good revival, actually, it's each and every one of you here today that uh, keeps me coming back. And I get a special joy from those who attend and participate on half of their distant homeland. So to our allies and partners, we salute you and thank you for not only making the trip, but staying awake long enough to share your knowledge and wisdom for the collective good. Thank you so much for being here. I'm especially grateful to stand shoulder to shoulder with NDTA Chairman John Dietrich, Vice Chairman Bill Woodauer, and President Andy Brown. Thank you for the warm welcome and the opportunity to add to NDTA's rich history dating back to 1944. You know, our history is rich because our community attracts and empowers purpose-driven professionals inside the uniform and out. And even then, some soar higher. Earlier this morning, we recognized exceptional individual and team accomplishments. In fact, the stage was full of them. I didn't think it was going to survive. And they embody the association, and they advance the goals of the joint deployment and distribution enterprise. These winners were bold enough to be decisive and to make a significant difference for all of us in the crucial areas of cybersecurity, port infrastructure, maritime fuel supply, air capacity, and supply chain support. If our youngest winners who were on the stage this morning took to heart the messages of Chief BK, they'll have the opportunity to return to the stage and join the ranks of giants, like this year's U.S. Transcom Pegasus Award recipient. Pegasus, the famed winged horse from Greek mythology, delivered the thunderbolts of Zeus, supported Bellerophon's fight against the chimera and provided hope by drawing forth life-giving springs. The Pegasus Award recognizes an individual, an organization, or group that advocates for U.S. Transcom and the broader joint deployment and distribution enterprise in the, in the conduct of its mission. This year's recipient accomplishes his accomplishments exemplify our highest values. He recently was named the 2024 Military Times of Veteran of the Year. He served two tours in Vietnam in the Marines, where he earned a Silver Star, Bronze Star, two Purple Hearts, and later founded FedEx with the same people first principles he learned in the Corps. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to present this year's Pegasus Award to none other than Mr. Fred Smith.
So I'm very honored to be here. Arguably, uh, this command of all 11 of the combatant commands is the hub around which the rest of the military operates. And we at FedEx have always been so honored and privileged to maintain a relationship with our involvement in craft and our uh, business relationship with DOD and particularly U.S. Transcom, and I had a great uh, pleasure of visiting with all our government sales folks who are here in force, and we're so proud of them. And I had uh, an even greater pleasure in spending a few minutes with uh, the general. What an impressive man. And this command is in very good hands, I can tell you, from the time that I spent with him. He told me, I think your dad's a Vietnam guy, and was there when he put those very large number of stars on his shoulder. And I know he's proud of me, General. So on behalf of half a million people who make FedEx go every day, I'm proud to accept this award. And again, we appreciate our relationship with the United States uh, government, and particularly the Department of Defense. Thank you again, General, and very honored. supposed to talk for five minutes and uh, the execs knocked on the door I think 20 minutes later looking very nervous <laughs> trying to make sure we were all in time uh, but he is a very impressive man and he loves all of us and uh, uh, we have a lot to uh, look up to him for so at this point uh, I'm not going to preach um, I'm not necessarily going to dictate anything uh, four days on the job, it's too soon for that. And I think you'll agree. Uh, but what I can do is just share some thoughts, uh, seed some ideas, and what I'd really like to do is move to the Q&A, because I think that's the part that's going to be the most productive. But I would like to uh, change things a little bit at this point. And Andy, I don't know who we need to talk to, but I understand we have some Transportation Academy folks in the room. Um, I did not get a chance to uh, give my seminar last year, and obviously didn't get a chance to give one this year, and so I'd like to spend a few minutes with Transportation Academy style um, to model for them. And then I understand that they can get credit when they attend a seminar, but I need to know who I can uh, talk to to see that if they're in the room today, they can get double credit. Yeah. Because <laughs> after they listen to this, they're going to be Right, we opened up this whole thing with the uh, theme of the greatest show. And we truly are the greatest show on earth. When the world needs us to do something, we find a way to be there. And so far, it's worked pretty good because we worked in a steady state world. Things have been fairly predictable. And by and large, no one has stood up to challenge us. But that's changing, and we know that. And But, but we've heard plenty of that. So the idea is, if things are going to change, then what problem are we trying to solve? And I've heard that throughout uh, conversations in the hallway, and I've heard that in some of the committees that we've been in. And it may not necessarily be what problem it is that we're trying to solve. As a senior leader, and I'm modeling for the academy folks here, if you don't know the answer, then you probably ought to figure out how you look at things and what framework will you use to be able to attack it. And then you get some fantastic experts to surround you, and then together you deliver. And so that's what I'm going to do today. I'm just going to share some thoughts and kind of model how I am starting to look at this so that together we can solve all of this. And so I'll begin with the title of uh, the 
presentation here, it is decision advantage, a key component to credible capacity. And I know we've had some really great fruitful discussions on decision advantage, and eventually we'll get there. But what's really important is the capacity. What's really important is our, abil our ability to get the job done, and then we'll figure out where we've fallen short and how can decision advantage help us with that. And so as I look at the world and how we need to get things done, I can't start with Transcom. I actually have to start with our allies and partners. And it is our allies and partners that are like-minded with us, that have a, a shared view of what security should be, that actually provides us the local and the regional access basing and oversight. And then once we have that relationship with them and we can have that access basing and oversight, then we can do amazing things together. We can exercise together. We can plan together. We can do things and find out a common lexicon, but the main thing is, is they also have an infrastructure and a network that they can teach us how to use if we need to stand with them shoulder to shoulder. And then once I have the destination figured out, then it's what happens in between. And what does that network look like and how do I get the the access to basing, how do I get the contracts, how do I get all the other things to be able to get to our allies and partners. And it is the component that oftentimes means the most to me, and it's the fourth component. Because you're the ones that are operating global every day. You're the ones that know what the alternatives are and where the ports are. You're the ones that know how to find the routes and the alternatives. You're the ones that know how to get access to the fuel. But you also have the perspective of the world, which is our responsibility in Transcom. Far too often, when folks are talking about a crisis or a conflict, they immediately zero in just on one piece of the earth, when our respective roles still require us to be global. And the best way for me to be able to learn about that and to make decisions is to work with you and learn that from you and always be in a position to fall in on the excellent network that you already have. The fourth component is dawning upon me, being an NDTA for the last two years, truly is the most critical component. And it provides the depth and the duration of sustainment once we actually get into something so that if somebody decides to start something, we can finish it. And we can finish it on our terms. Because of the like-minded approach to the globe from our allies and partners for the mutual security, and their desire to stay connected to the world, and because of the economic path and viability from the fourth component. It provides multiple pathways to success. And it gives capacity that always exists, but it needs to be nurtured. And I will need to make sure through this association that we continue to make those emergency programs, as I've come to term them, uh, stronger and easier for you to use, such that when we ask for the capacity and we're able to forecast it for you better, you have the latitude to pivot and actually provide that capacity for us. The next thing is, once we are having a global footprint, and posture through our partners and allies. And then once we are able to get the capacity and the posture through the fourth component, then the next situation becomes, what else do I have available to me that we can all share that gives us additional capacity beyond that that's enduring? And it's the whole of government approach here. And in the whole of government, it truly becomes not the regional interest, 
not the economic interests, but the interests of mutual security. And in that, it becomes the secret sauce because nearly everyone around the world has that same feeling. Nearly everyone around the world has that same desire. And we end up having a tremendous amount of friends that we can help when we need to respond somewhere. And so I applaud the Maritime Administration's focus to work directly to enhance readiness by purchasing additional ships, however they can get them. And, uh, and, and I'm really grateful to the Honorable Phillips for what she's doing and all of the other work that she's doing for the strategy in that realm. And I'm also grateful for all the things that she and her team are doing in order to work the labor piece to make sure that we can get the crews done. We cannot forget or survive the State Department's diplomatic expertise to secure the agreements that we need to gain and maintain the global access and to have the permissions that we need to do in order to operate. And not only that, to make sure that we are aligned in a mutual sense with those folks that we are going to stand with and help. And the combination of everything that we do in the regional security interests, in the economic interests, and in the national security interests all comes together in a very synergistic way for our mutual defense. And in the end, that's what it's all about. And so once we are able to do that, there's a tiny core of organic, highly trained people that we all admire, and those are the actual components of U.S. Transcom. And when the whole of government gives us the resources to do what we're being asked to do, and when the whole of government gives us the authorities that we need to actually get it done, tremendous things happen. Look at the video. This is what industry, government, allies and partners, and the military looks like when it's done right. But we all know that not everything goes smoothly. And I hear a lot of talk about contested logistics, and I'm okay with that because we know that we're going to have to face that. But I think it's a misnomer if we just concentrate on contested logistics as if it's something new. And what I'd like to do is just introduce the thought that Logistics is always contested. If nothing else, it is the perfect home for Murphy's Law. 
And I dare anybody to stand up and say that they've had a sustained operation where everything absolutely positively went well just because nature has a vote. The mechanical nature of things has a vote. The level of training of our people has a vote. Things are going to go wrong. But here in Transcom and the Joint Deployment Distribution Enterprise, we continue to excel at every turn, primarily because we're doing this. We bring the best of what we have. We bring our ideas and our challenges. We focus on them, and we find a way to overcome and adapt. And the neat thing about it is, by and large, we kind of understand all the possible ways that the mission can experience friction. We understand how things can go wrong, and we understand how to plan to get ahead of that. But the challenge now is we have some folks out there who will be very deliberate to produce those effects to hamper us. And that's the next step. So while we are pretty good at planning for contingencies just because things happen, how good are we really at anticipating what someone will do to actually produce those effects? And when I think of contested logistics in its purest form, uh, it can happen in the gray zone, and it can happen in the hot zone. And I've always believed the first place it's going to happen in the gray zone is on the nightstand. My alarm clock will probably not go off, and I'm going to be late. And so understanding that things can happen in a very low way to get around us, how do we overcome that? And so I'm very pleased by all the things that we're doing to get after just that. We have some subcommittees who are looking forward and we're having discussions between the industry and the government to make sure that we get after just that. And once all of that begins to come to fruition, once again, we're going to be assured of the capacity. But now the challenge becomes, can we use that capacity fast enough? And that is where decision advantage comes in. So what I've harvested throughout the week so far is us sort of kind of struggling a little bit to define decision advantage. And we've discussed ways that we could get it, and we've, dis we've introduced some things such as artificial intelligence, machine learning. We talked a lot about data. We talked about data sources access to the data. I understand there are even questions about how do we train each other to make sure that we can get it. But fundamentally, from a practitioner, I am not smart enough to keep up with General Silva and his gang. Okay? Dr. Plum, absolutely brilliant. I am not smart enough to keep up with her and go through all of those explanations that she gave for that. And the fireside chat completely left me behind. All right, but we talked about good stuff. But what I do know as a practitioner for decision advantage, what's important is being able to make the right decision fast enough to build enough time to be able to execute. And that didn't dawn upon me until yesterday as I continued to hear conversations amongst all of us, primarily from the fourth component with you're telling me that you can provide the capacity as long as you have the forecast and as long as you have enough time to make the pivot. And part of the problem is I might not be giving you that time because I might be too slow in making the decisions that you need. And that's why decision advantage is important. Because I know that you want to participate. I know that you want to make a difference, and it makes a difference for all of us for all the reasons that we started with. Regional security, economic viability, national defense. And so, while I'm not going to stand here and say what we should be doing exactly for decision advantage, what I am convinced of is that we all get it. Decision advantage is important. And we all get it that we have a role to play in that. But we also know that we have forms like this to be able to bring that together to figure out how we're going to do it. And with that, I will tell you, I will be able to sleep well at night. That I will be able to ask the right questions of the staff and the components. That I will have the energy and the drive and the focus 
to bring to this problem to make sure that we can get this further down the field because it will add to victory. Ladies and gentlemen, those are just a few thoughts. I think we'll be most productive if we transition to Q&A. And with that, I close this session and I look forward to your questions. Go ahead, Mickey. Rod. General, how do we need to change our thinking? Or do we need to change our thinking to protect the fourth component in this contested global environment? Can I get that last part, please? Yes, sir. How do we need to change our thinking to protect the fourth component in this contested environment? Yes. Uh, how do we need to change our thinking to protect the fourth component? Uh, so in an employment phase, I think we're in the right spot um, in terms of protecting. Um, primarily because we have great communication going on specifically in a crisis. Um, I know that there's always room for improvement to make the communication stronger, but uh, we in Transcom have been very forthright in presenting situations as we understand them and sharing what the threats are and allowing folks to know what the environment is actually like that we are asking them to operate in. In return, we listen to understand whether or not the fourth component can actually operate there or what alternatives they can provide. And as long as we're having that conversation, then the protection's there. How do we create decision advantage, not only at the senior leader level, but also at the tactical and operator level? Once again, decision advantage, in my view, is being able to do your job and being able to do it extremely well and being able to do it fast. And so um, help us senior leaders understand what may be standing in the way. Help us understand what information you need in order to make the decision that we're empowering you to make. And in that regard, uh, we will make sure that folks have that information, they can get those decisions made, and free us up to make a separate set of decisions. General, can you address how the adversaries, and multiple adversaries, are doing everything to stop the logistics elements before we and the fourth component and our allies and our partners and start the trucks or start the trains, get stuff to the port. How do we address all that that's going to contest us right before we start? In my mind, the first thing we need to do is just always assume that something is going to go awry and not automatically attribute it to an adversary. Um, and then that way we can really zero in on what the source of the problem is. The other thing, too, is understanding what it is we're trying to do and always know that there's a path to getting there, but also making sure that we can do things with a sense of urgency. Uh, being very free and frank with vulnerabilities and letting leadership know how to address those is key. Um, in my time with NDTA so far, uh, specifically in the cyber realm, I am extremely grateful to all of the companies out there who have been willing to work with us to accept the help that's available to you. And I think that if we don't do anything else but make sure that we continue to work after cyber hygiene, uh, life will, will be great. As I learn more and more about the global bulk fuel piece, um, making sure that we all have an understanding of what those requirements are and actually how to deliver and who we might also be able to rely on to help us move that fuel, that would be key as well. How do we test our progress towards decision advantage, for example, as part of exercises? I'm sorry, can you say the first part again, please? How do we test our progress towards decision advantage, for example, as part of exercises? Thank you. Um, so 
when we exercise uh, within the components, one of the first things that we'll do is we'll look at the exercise objectives and we'll also match those to a timeline uh, based on what the theater needs. So the first thing is when do they actually need us to be in place to set the theater? How fast can we set the theater? And part of how we measure that test is how many friends and how much capacity we can gain in order to match that pace. Um, as we chase after that pace, do we have the, the wherewithal to discover alternatives to get things done? And if, in fact, we cannot meet that pace, and to me, this is one of the most important parts, is can we actually describe what happens and the impact if we cannot meet that pace or the objective? And can we discuss very clearly and very plainly and very quickly what the cost would be to do something else or the cost of not being able to do that and not necessarily in monetary terms. And during the exercises, we may not be able to achieve all the things that we set out with, but the next stage for me would be the fix in the aftermath. And so how quickly can we measure ourselves in terms of addressing that? And as we continue to do this, we'll actually get stronger and we'll actually get faster and we'll actually be able to train ourselves to think in a different way that's not just maintaining a set schedule, presuming that the world is stable, we'll actually be looking how to create our own future when the world is not. General, many of the conversations this week regarding our near peer adversaries have focused on the initial challenges of getting to the fight. In some of these conversations, there seems to be an underlying assumption that the outcome of the fight will be decided in days or weeks or months. However, that fight could last for years. What do you believe are the biggest challenges to sustaining a multi-front war that may last years? I tend to look at it from the uh, standpoint that since we're in competition right now, we're already there, we're just not in the surge portion of it. So we're in a multi-front competition right now. Um, and anywhere that could go super hot. And so uh, we have a lot to learn, we have a lot to harvest, and we have a lot to actually look ourselves in the mirror for right now and accept. Bottom line is we're handling the competition extremely well, primarily because all of us are engaged in making sure that we keep ourselves viable and we're cooperating and we are still getting things moved and still getting things done. And when we need the extra capacity uh, from the fourth component, you're actually able to produce and you're able to produce in ways that we cannot. And you can figure out ways to get it done in ways that we cannot. And we depend on that and we always will. Uh, should things go hot and we get into a crisis, we do have a significant ability to shift to address the crisis and build time for the leaders to actually come up with other tools to use. Uh, now the thing becomes whether or not we go into a protracted conflict. And while I can't truly envision all of the conditions that would exist in that vein, um, actually the world would change as we know it. And the first thing we're going to do is change our priorities. And when we change the priorities, we'll have a separate set of conditions in front of us and we'll rise to the challenge for that. General, how do we take into account the homeland is no longer a sanctuary and the homeland will be a fighting AOR with the competition for limited resources and troops? Uh, so how do we deal with that environment rather than always focusing on the OCONUS environment? When I talk to groups these days to try to help them begin to figure out how to think differently about that, um, I go back to asking a simple question. How many of us did fire drills in elementary school? Okay. How many of us recognized the way that the bells rang that let us know that it was a fire drill? How many of us understood that the proper response to that system of bells was to rise in an organized, deliberate fashion and then line up or whatever it was and marshal ourselves outside the school and take a head count. Okay. 
How many of us remember nuclear drills in elementary school? Not so many hands. Okay, not so many hands. And I think it's important that sometimes we revisit the past so we understand what's actually coming to us in the future. So when we did the nuclear drills, we had the same bell system, and the bell had the same ring, but it rang in a different way. And we learned to understand that when that bell rang in that way, it was a different kind of threat. And that threat taught us that all of us were at risk all the time. There was a national consciousness that somebody could do something to us. They had the ability to do something to us. And in some cases, they may have the intent to do something to us. We've lost that. We've lost that. And so while we are starting to understand a little bit about the acute and the pacing threats, once we have a national understanding that we are actually at risk and at threat, then we will start doing things different in the homeland. And we will start making different priorities to make sure that we can shore up the homeland. And then we will connect stronger from the homeland to the forces that are actually required to deter in a different way. And so with that being said, yes, the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. We have great, great power to deter in the kinetic realm. The question will be, how do we continue to get stronger in the non-kinetic and the gray zone realm? And there's a lot of work to be done there. Sir, the world is too large and things happen too fast for us to do everything on our own. How do we enable our allies and our wannabe allies to join forces despite intimidation from our adversaries? So part of that goes back to this idea of uh, how do we see security and how do we see defense and how do we see deterrence and what's in common with the rest of the, rest of the world. And uh, virtually everyone really desires free and open access to the global commons. Uh, we're starting to call those domains now. And so if that's in fact what we really want, then those are the conversations we need to have on the common ground. And so once we understand that we'd like to have a safe cyber space and safe cyber activity, then we will find ways to cooperate in that. Um, and the same goes for the rest of the commons. Uh, what I've learned going through is that there's a tremendous amount to learn from allies and partners, uh, especially when we have their perspective on the different ways that folks can feel threatened and how to address that. But once we come together and we continue to exercise and we continue to have conversations and we continue to gather in a venue like this, uh, then the world is our oyster. Sir, how is Transcom addressing the growing reliance on technology in transportation? And what steps are being taken to ensure resilience and cybersecurity? That's pretty packed and pretty deep. Um, if you've ever spent time with Ted Ryback, you know that there's a lot there to work with, but there's a lot to be afraid of also. Um, but uh, there are experts in the room that can address that. But from what I've seen and experienced and how I've operated within Transcom, uh, there is a tremendous amount of effort in that realm simply because data has value and we move data as well. And data needs to be protected. And perhaps in some cases, data needs to be escorted. Where we store the data matters. Um, how we hand off the data to someone else matters. Um, in a lot of ways, it's the same way that we handle cargo, fuel, or troops. And so uh, while I don't understand all the beeps and squeaks with that, um, that is one of my top priorities. And that's also what I told the folks on the Hill. Sir, how can we enhance relationships and data sharing between Transcom and civilian federal agencies such as those at the Department of Transportation to improve our ability to meet our mission? Uh, with regards to other agencies, part of that uh, will start at the top. And the relationships that I have yet to build um, across the government um, still amongst the fourth c component. 
and setting the conditions for everyone around us to be able to do the same thing. And so once we have that open door and the relationships to be able to call each other and work through the problems, uh, then life will be grand. Uh, one of the things that I learned in a forum posting that was very difficult is uh, while I was in country, uh, oftentimes we had very, very, very difficult and frank conversations. And at the time, uh, General Lyons came through to visit. And he did the favor of having an engagement uh, with my counterparts and the leadership there. And when we were done with it, he said, wow, that was tough. But it was worthwhile. And I asked him, why is that? And he said, you can only have a tough conversation if you have a relationship. And you can only solve difficult problems if you have a relationship. And so uh, my going to work to make sure that I establish that at my level will strengthen what already exists and we'll be able to get things done. I think we have time for one more. Sir, shifting gears, in your experience with truly inspirational leaders, what leadership tenets did you take from them and made your own? I learned far too late to make friends and have contacts. I learned that far too late. And I lost a tremendous amount of opportunity to make a difference for people because I have no way of helping every single person that I ought to help. Oftentimes that help is in the hands of someone else. And my Rolodex was pretty small. And so as I came along, I started eventually to build more and more relationships with other people and then being able to turn to them to help, to help my own folks. And so uh, that was the biggest lesson that I learned is to get down to brass tacks, understand that this is a human endeavor, and just be humans with humans. The other thing that I learned is it's okay not to be perfect. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing in front of you right now. But as long as we have the desire, and as long as we have the proper orientation, and as long as we know that we are in the right space working with others to get to a better place, the rest will take care of itself. So whoever asked that question, thank you so much. You, know, you made me vulnerable. Okay, but we got through it. But I do want to say, in the 44 seconds that I have left, it's an absolute joy to still be in the family. While I'm, quote, unquote, no longer in the Air Force, but I'm in Transcom, with you, I feel at home. And with you, the future is bright. And with you, together, we deliver. Thank you.